I here present some details of geology and tectonic setting of Iceland, and synthesis of volcano behavior and magma moments during the Krabla rifting episode 1975-86 in Iceland. We will put into common context the datasets from Krabla we have looked at individually in some earlier lectures, add more data, and combine it into a description of a rifting episode. Why Krabla? Even if these events happened some decades ago, the lessons learned are important, in particular in the context of repeated eruptions in the same magmatic system with periods of localized magma accumulation interrupted by periods of magmatic intrusions and eruptions. Let's start with the geological and tectonic setting. This figure shows a geological map of Iceland with the location of Krabla. The rocks are dominantly basalts, except for rhyolites and silicic rocks shown in yellow. Shown in red are lava fields that have flowed in the post-glacial time after the disappearance of the ice cap of the most recent glacial period, ending about 10,000 years ago. Krabla is located in the northern volcanic zone of Iceland, which is the volcanic area stretching from north of the Vatnajökull ice cap, shown in white on the map, towards the northern coast. Calderas are marked with black outlines in this figure. The Krabla caldera formed about 100,000 years ago and is now mostly filled with younger rock formations. The systematic change in rocks away from the northern volcanic zone, according to the color code, indicates steady increase in age of volcanic rocks away from the rift zone. The rocks marked as blue are older than 3.3 million years, and grey is younger than 800,000 years. This pattern in age is the result of plate spreading. Material formed in the rift zone is carried out of the rift zone by plate spreading over millions of years. The volcanic zones in Iceland are divided up into volcanic systems, as this map shows. Each system typically consists of a central volcano and a transecting fissure swarm, aligned along the plate boundary. Plate spreading in Iceland occurs in a close to east-west direction, as the arrows indicate, at a full rate, that's a velocity of one plate relative to the other, of about 19 mm per year. But what are central volcanoes? These are foci of volcanic production along the volcanic zones. Many of them are associated with silicic rocks, high temperature geothermal areas, and some have developed a caldera. Volcanoes is frequent at the central volcanoes. Both inside and outside of the central volcanoes, monogenetic craterols have formed in fissure eruptions, often grouping together in an array of normal faults. Such zones of extensive fissuring and normal faulting have in Iceland been termed fissure swarms. Central volcanoes within the volcanic rifts in Iceland are, as a rule, transacted by a fissure swarm. The Krabla caldera has an extensive geothermal system and it is bordered by rhyolite formations. Krabla has us all the characteristic of a typical central volcano. It is transacted by a 100 km long fissure swarm that is about 5 to 10 km wide. Central volcano and the fissure swarm constitute together the Krabla volcanic system. This third figure of Iceland shows seismicity in recent years. A large part of the activity occurs in transform zones where the plate boundary shifts location. The Krabla area has been relatively quiet, but with some seismicity occurring there, mostly in relation to the geothermal activity. The divergent plate movements cause extension across the rift zones. This leads to accumulation of extensional stress across the rift zone that is then released during major events along the plate boundary, as in the Krabla area in 1975-84 rifting episode. We have in earlier modules looked at the data sets shown in this and the next figure. In this figure, the upper panel shows earthquakes during inflation periods occurring within the Krabla caldera in blue, and earthquakes during deflation periods occurring out in the Krabla fissure swarm shown in red. 
The lower panel shows a crapula tilt curve for the drifting period, with red stars marking eruptions. Upward tilt marks inflation of the caldera when earthquakes occur there. The sudden drops are deflation periods when seismicity occurred out in the fissure swarm. This figure shows then in the upper part an example of the pattern of uplift inferred from leveling during inflation, predictions of a Moggy model, and residuals. The lower panel, the inferred volume chains and source depth versus time, and observations at each time are compared to the first one and inverted separately. The inferred source depth is in the range of 3.5 to 5 kilometers. To fully understand the activity at Krapla, we need to evaluate together what happened in the center of the magmatic system and out in its physics form, considering seismicity, ground deformation, fault movements, and eruptions. This figure here provides an overview. The lower panel shows elevation chains within the Krapla caldera that has the same form as the tilt curve presented earlier. The upper panels provide an overview of activity in the fissure swarm. The graph on the left shows what part of the fissure swarm was active. The parts activated during digging events are shown in black and in red when fissure eruptions occurred. From 1975 to 84, around 20 dike intrusions occurred. The main periods of activity are numbered. The upper right panel shows the mapped cumulative widening across the fissure swarm, and how that cumulative widening is a sum of widening that occurred in individual diking events and eruptions. Cumulative widening averages to 4 to 5 meters, corresponding to 2 or 2 and a half centuries of the long term spreading. The initial dike intrusion in December 1975 was by far the largest in the episode, intruding about 60 km long segment of the fissure swarm. In this event, most widening occurred about 50 km north of the Krapla caldera, where seismicity was also most intense. The dike was associated with a minor eruption within the Krapla caldera, which subsided by up to 2 meters consistent with a localized pressure drop in a magma body at relatively shallow depth. The initial dike was followed by a sequence of smaller intrusions that began in September 1976 and occurred in irregular sequences until 1984. Until 1980, most of the dikes propagated lateral linear crust, accompanied by surface fissuring and faulting. The volumes of erupted lavas were only a small fraction of the intruded magma volumes. Subsequently, eruptive activity increased, with six of the final seven dikes breaching the surface and volumes increasing. It is likely that the change in activity reflects a reduction in tensional stresses to a level that did not allow dikes to propagate over long distances. It is important to note that between digging events, seismicity was mostly confined to the caldera, which uplifted at a rate of up to 6 mm per day, fastest immediately following a dike intrusion, and gradually slowing down. Also important is that the digging events in the fissure swarms were directly correlated with activity within the Krabla caldera, where subsidence occurred. Dikes propagated laterally from the caldera, as this figure shows. Seismic observations indicate of that process are shown here in the left panel and schematic model in the right panel. Each color shows earthquakes associated with one diking event, how seismicity propagated away from the caldera. The y-axis shows distance from the center of the Krabla caldera and the x-axis the time. A clear example is the July 1978 drifting episode, the yellow dots. The seismicity tracks the front of a dike propagating laterally away from the caldera. The combined seismicity and ground deformation observations thus provide here a compelling evidence for localized magma upflow 
am dachkumulation under the caldera and from there the delivery of magma into the rift zone during diking events.